Hi everyone. Uh, this session is part one of uh, other molecular biology techniques. I hope you have already watched the session on uh, types of cloning and polymerase chain reaction. Excluding PCR, I have made one session uh, which would include other molecular biology techniques and that would include recombinant DNA technology, microarray, comparative genomic hybridization, lac operon and most importantly about CRISPR. And because I don't want you to feel overwhelmed, I have done this in two parts. In the first part, I will be telling you about recombinant DNA technology. So what is recombinant DNA technology? We know it's a type of cloning. And what is cloning? We know cloning is production of identical copies. And here we are trying to produce identical copies of DNA. Or in other words, we are trying to replicate a desired fragment of DNA multiple times. For this replication, there are few requirements. What are the requirements? Just recollect this. I've told you this so many times, even during replication session, as well as in types of cloning session, I've told you this. So what are the requirements of replication? You need a DNA polymerase enzyme. You need primers. You need deoxynucleotide triphosphates, magnesium or manganese to act as a catalyst. You need a buffer. Depending upon what provides us with all these requirements, cloning is of two types. If all these requirements are provided by a whole living cell like E. coli, then that is called a cell-based cloning. And cell-based cloning is nothing but recombinant DNA technology. That is what I am going to discuss now. Instead of a whole living cell, if you take a small test tube and if you allow the replication to happen in the tube outside the cell, then that is called as in vitro cloning or enzyme based cloning otherwise called as polymerase chain reaction. So now about recombinant DNA technology. I want you to follow the steps involved in recombinant DNA technology imagining that you are trying to produce insulin on a large scale. To produce insulin protein on a large scale you would need multiple copies of insulin genes. From where do you think you get those insulin genes? We get those from human chromosome. So what is the first step in recombinant DNA technology? You take human chromosome and you cleave this human chromosome into multiple fragments using a DNA scissor called as restriction endonuclease. If you are asking me why are we cutting the human chromosome, why not we amplify the whole human chromosome, that would be a waste of time and waste of raw material. Instead, if you cut the human chromosome into multiple fragments and then if you identify one fragment with the gene of interest and if you amplify only that fragment, that would be optimal utilization of time and resources. Okay, that is why what is the first step? You take human chromosome, you cleave human chromosome into multiple fragments using restriction endonucleases. So what is the first tool that you want for recombinant DNA technology? The first tool is restriction endonucleases. After you have all these fragments, in the next step, we are going to identify one fragment with gene of interest. Here, this is the fragment with gene of interest that has been identified. How do you identify the fragment with gene of interest? For that, we employ a technique called as hybridization technique or blotting technique. So that is the second tool that you want for recombinant DNA technology. I will be telling you about all the tools of recombinant DNA technology one by one in a short while. For now, just remember the list of tools. Okay. So the second tool is hybridization or blotting technique using which you have identified that this is the fragment with gene of interest. Now you have to introduce this fragment with gene of interest into E. coli. Directly it cannot get into E. coli, it needs a vehicle. That vehicle should carry the fragment and get into E. coli and that vehicle is called as the vector. So what is the third tool that you want for recombinant DNA technology? It is vector. After you identify the vector, you should cut the vector because only after you cut the vector, you can introduce the fragment into the vector. So how do we cut the vector? Using the same restriction endonuclease, which is used for cutting the human chromosome, you also cut the vector. Okay. After cutting the vector, you are going to link the fragment with gene of interest to the vector to form recombinant vector. So why am I calling it as recombinant vector? Because it has got two unrelated genomes. 
one is a prokaryotic vector the other one is eukaryotic gene fragment so what is this called as recombinant vector that is why the technique is called as recombinant dna technology after you form recombinant vector now comes the most difficult part of this technique when you are going to introduce this recombinant vector into e coli why is this very difficult because e coli is a prokaryote which has got cell wall so introducing such a larger recombinant vector into a cell with cell wall is going to be difficult so what we do is using high electric currents we introduce pores onto the cell wall and through those pores recombinant vector will be taken up so this step is called as electroporation step and this electroporation step is considered considered as the rate limiting step of recombinant dna technology why because the ultimate success of this technique or uh, so what determines the number of products that you get is it is based on how successfully you have introduced the recombinant vector into e coli so introducing recombinant vector into the cell is the rate limiting step of recombinant dna technology once you are done with this step the rest e coli takes care because whenever the rec whenever the vector replicates you get multiple copies whenever the cell divides also you get multiple copies so this is an outline of step involved in recombinant dna technology now let's try to understand about all these tools one by one okay so the first one is about restriction endonucleases so restriction endonucleases are enzymes which cut at restricted sites they cut at specific sites and those sites are always palindromic sequences what is palindrome in literature in literature palindrome is a word or a phrase which has the same meaning when read from either side yeah for example uh, rotor r o t o r read it from either side it's the same manorama read it from either side it's the same right so this is palindrome in literature now what is palindromic sequence in genetics palindromic sequence in genetics is a double stranded sequence can you see that here it's a double stranded sequence wherein as the 3 prime 5 prime strand sequence you have the 5 prime 3 prime strand sequence read in the reverse direction yeah look at the 3 prime 5 prime strand sequence what is it it is nothing but the 5 prime 3 prime strand sequence read in the reverse direction only then you will call it as a palindromic sequence and all your restriction endonuclease is cut only at palindromic sequences and depending upon how these enzymes cut this palindromic sequences the enzymes are of two types one is sticky and producing restriction endonuclease the other type is blunt and producing restriction endonuclease so what are the two types of restriction endonucleases one is sticky and producing enzyme the other one is blunt and producing enzyme what is a sticky and producing restriction endonuclease this type of enzyme will cut both the strands at two different sites instead of cutting both the strands at the same site like after the third one or after the first one or after the last one yeah instead of cutting both the strands at the same site yeah instead of cutting like this if the enzyme cuts both the strands at two different sites if the enzyme cuts both the strands at two different sites okay so that the cut ends produced are staggered you know this will be one end right this will be one end this will be the other end so the cut ends produced are staggered in that case you will call it as a sticky end producing enzyme why because using the same enzyme as i told you previously you don't only cut the human chromosome you also cut the vector suppose this represents the end of the fragment with gene of interest and if this represents the end of the vector what will happen when you bring both these close to each other the fragment with gene of interest and the vector they have sticky ends right yeah because they have complementary bases they have sticky ends so they stick together easily so what is the advantage of using a sticky end producing restriction endonuclease formation of recombinant vector is easier so what is a blunt end producing restriction endonuclease here the enzyme cuts both the strands at the same site like this 
yeah, after the first or after the second or after the third. So what will happen to the ends? The ends will be blunt. Okay, so that is called as a blunt end producing restriction endonuclease. So what is the disadvantage of using a blunt end producing restriction endonuclease? Even if you bring the fragment, the gene of interest and the vector, they don't stick together easily. You will end up using very strong DNA ligases to ligate them. So the disadvantage of blunt end producing restriction endonuclease is that formation of recombinant vector is difficult. And that is why these days most commonly we use only sticky end producing restriction endonucleases. And the only blunt end producing restriction endonuclease which is still in use is HPA1. This is provided as an example in Harper so it can be asked to you. So which is the one blunt end producing restriction endonuclease which is still used for recombinant DNA technology. It is HPA1 otherwise forming recombinant vector with a blunt end producing enzyme is difficult. So that is all about restriction endonucleases. Okay, so using these enzymes, you have cut human chromosome into multiple fragments. What is the next step? The next step is you identifying the fragment with gene of interest. 